Hey, welcome to Elder's Corner. Come on in, guys. Let me just get myself together. Oh, God, let's get to... Wait a minute, guys. We have to get this camera in order. How y'all doing? Welcome. Oh, Pastor, it looks like I got you out. How y'all doing? So, welcome to Elder's Corner. My name is Elder Nessa. Remember, I told you guys you could just call me Nessa. This this space and time that we're in right now is I want to meet you guys to an uh, elder in my life, one of the leaders of my life. And so, Elder's Corner, like I explained to you, is reality meeting Christian principles. And so, on this time and moment in space. We use this space to just talk about in-depth things of real-life situations, um, current um, news and current events. Um, we even talk about behaviors and consequences from them. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy um, Sunday service at 1 p.m. You know, it was a great opportunity to just be used by the Lord. And, you know, we talked about the prophetess Miriam. And so we learned that Miriam jealousy kept, um, killed her gifts. Um, Miriam was jealous of Moses' first wife, Sephora. And the only reason she was jealous is because she was a maniac. It wasn't nothing that she did. It wasn't nothing um, that she knew or kept from Miriam. It was just the mere fact that she wasn't from um, um, her people. She wasn't an Israelite. And that killed her gift. So never be so jealous that it would destroy your gift or your ministry. Enough of all this talking that I'm giving you. <laughs> I would like to introduce to you guys Elder Eric Dixon. <laughs> How you doing, Pastor? Um, I'm good. I'm blessed and highly favored. I am so glad you took some time out today to come on the Elder's Corner and, um, you know, this opportunity so that people can get to be around real um ordained ministers and see that we're real we're real human we're real people and um you know being a minister you know sometimes put us on a high pedestal that we can't even be human you know we can't even um sometimes hang around certain types of people in certain situations and so you know because it will look like something you know and so um this is the opportunity for you know normal people to be around ordained ministers how are you I'm good. I'm good. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to jump right in. I mean, you saying just being around ordained ministers. And a lot of times, a lot of you, you hear about so many different ordained ministers going through different scandals, certain things happening. Right. And and, and, and me personally, I think it, in, even in my own personal experience, in my own history, I've learned that sometimes your associations uh, with people that are not on your peer level can cause major damage to the ministry that God has given you. Uh, it's important that people hang out with peers on their own level. Right. So the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Right. You know. So it's important for people to hang out with people on their level. You know, ministers should hang out with ministers. Give God give you a call in your life. You need to hang out with preachers so you can learn how to act as a preacher when you're not in the pulpit. A lot of preachers don't learn how to act outside of the pulpit. What are behaviors appropriate in the pulpit? What are some things that even though it ain't a sin, you can't do around any of the sins? Right. You know, these are these are lessons that's not being taught to ministers. And some ministers are learning those lessons the hard way. Right, right. Well, and, and that's how we created this space. That's why Elders Court had created this space. Because that's some of the stuff that we're we going to, you know, me and you're going to tackle some stuff today um, about different colleagues and behaviors and stuff. So there's one particular thing that has been stuck out to me today. And a thorn. Paul always talked about this thorn. Um, this thorn represented um, his issues, his sin. And, and the things he wish he, you know, he wish he couldn't do, he found himself doing it. And it was sin and it was evil. And he realized he was doing these things, not intentionally, but it was a part of who he was. And I thank God that God's grace was sufficient enough for him. And you can find those set of scriptures in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 12, 7 through um, 12, I think it is. 7 through 9. Seven through nine. Seven through nine. How do you feel about that? What do you, so explain us what do you take 
thorn? What does thorn mean to you? A, a thorn is an issue. Uh, the Bible never says what Paul's issue was, but it, it did say that a demon from hell was sent to bucket him. Which I mean, whatever his infirmity was, he would get constant and chronic whatever from it. Whether it was flare-ups, whether it was swelling, whether it was, you know, there's many different theological theories as right. to what Paul's infirmity was. But there's nothing soundly that lets us know what it was. We believe that maybe his face was deformed because of the scars that he got from having his the scales removed from his eyes. Remember, right. when he got his sight back that he was... His face was getting deformed, but it doesn't, it doesn't tell us. But what we do know is that God said something to him there that was very powerful, that his grace was sufficient for him. And I constantly like to re-remind re, re people, re, to remind people of the definition of grace. You know, grace is God's ability to do what I can't do by myself. Right. You know, we, we, we give these slim understandings of the word grace, but grace is God's, it's his ability. You know, and, and the funny thing that, that, that we get sidetracked in is that we got to understand that it's God's ability that does whatever needs to be done. Okay. When we, when we, can, get, when we can gather that aspect of it, that God, his grace is sufficient, then we're able to walk into what God has for us. If we, if we, can't, if we can't understand what his ability is, there's no way we can get what we want. If I don't believe that God's a healer, there's no way I can get some healing. Right. If I, if I don't believe that, you know, he's a deliverer, there's no way I can get the deliverance. You know, but understanding that his ability, God's ability to do what I can't do by myself is sufficient for me. That's enough. So, Pastor, so that, that, now, thank you for being a ministry, because that was ministry. Now, let, let's, let's talk about this in a format that People who don't go to church, mm -hmm. who who don't read the Bible, you know, they might have had lessons for grandma, but they went to church so much that they hate church now. Mm -hmm. Or people who never even been around it, don't even understand what you're talking. What you talking about? Mm -hmm. Let's 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 break it down for them. So the thorn that we're talking about is sin. What? Well, the thorn may or may not have been sin. We, um, for this particular scripture, now Paul does does get clear about the fact that there was times in his life that he wanted to do the right thing, but he couldn't. And he talks about that more more over in, in the book of Romans, in Romans. the seventh chapter. Right. Where he talks about that, that thing I didn't want to do, I find myself doing. You know, but then he talks about that grace. Then he talks about... You know, so, so but before you need the grace, there still have to be something going on that's separating you from God. Yeah, there, and, there's things that sin, that's what sin means. It means to be separate from God, to right. be separate from God. Which means that there's some things that could be in my life that can separate me from God that you can have no power with processing. I mean, an example would be Facebook. See, I can't spend four hours a day on Facebook. That would separate me from quality time that I need to be spending in prayer or with God. Separating me from him. So that could become a, a sin in my life. For me, spending that much time on Facebook. Whereas it wouldn't be a problem in somebody else's life. This is why people can't go to somebody else and get a do, do not list for them for their Christian walk. Right. You know, right. People can't give you a do or do not do list. What you do is you come into a relationship with God. And as you build your relationships, the power of God changes us into who he's made us to be. Right. So I got some questions that I had got from a few of our followers, and we're going to just dig into this, and I just want y'all to keep in mind, today when we use the vernacular, the one we're talking about anything that can separate you um, from God, God's presence, God's blessings, God's anointing. Um, it could be sin or infirmity, as, you, as we learned with Paul in two different situations. Um, he was talking about the evil, and then he talked about the infirmary. And so, whenever we use this thorn, please keep in mind, this is what we're using it as, and those were the scriptural basis in which we, we dug up to be able to use that principle. How old was you when you, found, uh, when you uh, first heard God's voice? When I got, first got my call to ministry? Well, we're talking about personally hearing his voice. Personally hearing his voice. Wow. To know that this it was, was God speaking to me. Yes. I was 12. 
You was 12? I was 12 the first time I heard God's voice. And I had been praying to hear it. I've been asking to hear it because, like I said, since I was a little boy, I knew I was going to be get, a preacher. Get, get the audience you know, I, I, I knew I was going to be a preacher. So uh, I spent a lot of time in my world. Right. I spent a lot of time in my world. So, uh, yeah, I was 12. Um, and I heard his voice. It was one morning I got up and I went to the bathroom. And I had just got finished getting dressed. And all he said was, I love you. That was the first thing I heard God say to me was, I love you. And because I was at a really, there was a lot going on in my life as a poor 12 year old. Right. My parents were getting ready to officially be divorced. I mean, they had been separated for years, but officially going to be divorced. My mother was um, seeing someone else. My father was already remarried. And, and it was just, I was at a place in my life where, I don't know, things didn't make sense. And for that, God gives us what we need to be able to make it through whatever we have to go through. When God speaks to you, it's always hope. It's right. always encouraging. It's always moving you forward. You know, even if it's even if it's in a warning, because a warning can be encouraging. You know, if I encourage you, you know what I'm saying. So, so when God speaks to us; it always moves us forward, and that's what it did for me. Now, I went through the normal teenage stuff, you know, being a hardhead, going out, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I I, I did all of that stuff as a teenager. Right. right. I got back into ministry at I got back into the church when I was about nineteen in the military. In the military, yeah, and that's when I, that's when God spoke to me frequently because I was so I spent twelve hours at work and three of those hours at work I was spending my work and then when I get out for work I was spending four hours in my work before I go to sleep so that's all I did was working and to read the Bible and um, so it was like God was constantly talking to me I, I think that was one of the most powerful mo mo moments in my life and I tell people that my strength comes from the Word. The word can be your strength. I'm telling you, uh, it 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 was the word that brought me out when I went when I went back into my struggles with life. Um, it was the word. The word brought me back. I'm telling you, the word to keep you. Can you explain to us tangibly how the word, where it, because like like people you know always say the word uh, helped them through something, like like. How? How? Could you explain to us how the word, and can you give us an example so we can understand how you got to that point where you can read God's scriptures, or you can read the Bible, and you can get in a situation, and that scripture help you get through that? Because one thing we have to first understand is that the word is alive. Right. You have to believe that the word is alive. How do you know the word is alive? Because Jesus is alive. Right. And if G Jesus is the word. So when the more word I got in me, the more Jesus I have in me. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Uh, you're, you're only eating the word. You're only eating more of him. The more of him is in you, what what's going to come out when calamity comes? The word. Right. What's going to happen when somebody talks about you on your job? The word's going to come out. What's going to happen when you're struggling in a situation? The word. The word is going to come out. So we'll, we'll begin to use the word as a Almost like you know, it's a sword. The Bible says it's a sword to be able to cut my way out of situations. Knowing how to cut your way out of a situation is, is when Paul talked about rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, being able to take that word and put it to a situation and know it's going to be all right. Our current situation. You see, I've been giving the church I'm giving, and I'm giving you guys as well. Psalms 91, you know, take that psalm and, and apply it to the situation. So get in it twice a day and begin to watch how the word will envelop you and protect you because you put it around you. And if, the, if God is God, then his word is true. And if his word is true, stand on it. Right. Stand on it. Right. You had only so far. I was going to ask you about what you've given the church. But, <laughs> um, so when, was your, when were you first ordained? I was first licensed. I was 19. Okay. I was licensed in the Free Will Baptist Association in South Carolina. At the time, my, my, my pastor was the vice moderator. Um, yeah, I was licensed at 19. Uh, did ministry in uh, Japan, Guam, um, California. Uh, 
Philippines, um, on the USS Midway. Um, so I had an opportunity to do some ministry. Um, Worldwide, internationally. Yeah, I've, I've traveled some places. I've been to a few churches. I've seen God's hand move. I've seen God do some awesome things that I didn't thought was possible, which even made my faith grow even more, you know. So um, God, I've, I've experienced some stuff, you know. I've also had some struggles, you know. I ain't always, I, I got licensed at 19, but between 19 and, uh, and, and, and 35, a whole lot of things happened in my life and um, a whole lot of struggles and a whole lot of darkness and, and what I believe is the Bible says that all things work together to the good for them who love the Lord yes. and who are called according to his purpose. Yes. And going back to the scripture where you talk about the thorn in the flesh, you know, um, he says, you know, in my in his strength is made perfect in my weakness. You know, so now on looking on the backside of my of my of a 15 year struggle, and I look back over it and I say, if I had not been through that, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right now. I wouldn't be able to reach people who feel that God said that you can't be used. I wouldn't be able to tell somebody who's struggling on the streets that God said you're not going to have to stay on the streets. You don't have to be on the streets. Right. I don't have to tell somebody that was great in school and not as strong out on drugs to tell them that they can't turn their life around and God can use them again. Because all of that's possible if you just turn around. Just turn around and just give it to him. Get in that word. Talk to him. Build your personal relationship with him. Yeah, it's good to have a relationship with the saints. It's very good to have a relationship with the saints. But it's more important that you build a personal relationship with God. Get in that word. Begin to talk to him. I promise you, if you get in your word and you talk to him, I promise you he'll respond. He'll yeah. respond. I promise you he will respond. So I heard you say reach out. So... You have a church. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about your church. By Faith Ministries. Uh, it, it's so funny how By Faith Ministries came to be. Uh, I, I really haven't talked much about how we came to be. But um, By Faith Ministries, I, I was uh, the administrator. Um, position you hold. Yes. By Faith. <laughs> I was the administrator for um, Household of Faith Ministries. Um, well, uh Bishop Isaiah Hayes is the senior pastor, and whom I like to call my little big brother. Um, you know, um, sometimes in ministry things happen, and he had to take care of some stuff, some things he felt he had to do. And me as his administrator, let me tell you something. I, I truly believe in taking care of leadership. And I, I wanted to go above and beyond to make sure that the ministry, that the vision that he showed, shared with me, would be able to stand while he take care of what he needed to take care of. And um, things just didn't iron out that way and, 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 and things began to evolve on another level, which I won't discuss, but um, I prayed about it and God gave, laid on my heart for me to move on. And um, did I have any ill feelings with um, Bishop Isaiah? I definitely want to say it you know, on camera that no, I had no ill issues with him at all. He's my brother. If he needs me right now, he really can call me and get what he needs from me. And if I need him, I can call him and I'll probably be able to get what I need from him. But, um, you know, th this is a way to that I, I, I want my brothers to understand that as ministry goes on, it's not our will. It's God's will. You know, it's, it's, it's never on us. And we have to be able to accept that, especially if we know God gave us a vision, you know. And I do believe in his vision. Right. Um, Bishop Hayes' vision for household of faith. Definitely cannot die. He has an event posted on Facebook. You can go to his Facebook page, y'all, and look it up. He has a, a venue come up in June. You know, and I plan to attend that um, because I believe in the vision of that house, the, the vision that he has for his house. So however, God has made a vision on my heart. And um, at first, I didn't want to do it. Uh, uh, Elder can attest to that. You know, um, I did not want to assume the role of a pastor because, like I said, I've been around preachers since I was a little boy. And, right. I see the struggles that comes with being a pastor. I see the, the heartaches and some of it I'm experiencing, you know, the nights you can't sleep, worrying about your church, worrying about people in the church, worrying about right. people take care of themselves, concerned about people's behaviors, concerned about people's addictions, you know, all this stuff, you know, you're, you're praying and you're seeking God, but sometimes you don't get no sleep, you know, and I, and I knew that and I didn't want that. And, um, but what I've done is I've found joy in it. Because if God gives you something, he's going to give you the strength to deal with it. Yes, he will. And um, he's given me the strength to deal with it. And I love it. I, I, I honestly have to say that. I'm, I would be lying if I said I didn't love it. I love 
I have a very small flock, but I love the people in my church. We work very hard. Um, we, we support the ministry. Um, we, we look out for each other. We check on each other. Yes. We're, we're a very strong, small family, and we want to grow. And in God's time, I'm sure he will grow us. But one of the things that I understand that God is kind of taking us back in time, you know, to a time when there, that churches was in houses, you know. <laughs> churches are back in houses, yeah. you know. And, and for, for my church, we have church in the house, you know. We have church in house and we make room. Uh, we have a, a, a convenient space that we can convert it over and have a little smaller church in here and, and we can have service. So I, I always implore people to come, you know, after this COVID-19 thing is done. Oh, God. Um, and we can um, and all worship together, you know. I, I did not close our church um, for COVID-19 um, because we have a small church. Um, and I know some people are not going to come out in this weather. So I, there was no need for me to do that. But if one or two show up, we have one or two in service. But um, last Sunday, everybody stayed home. And I was okay with that, you know. Um, yeah, I was okay with that. Okay. So speaking of COVID-19, let's talk about that a little bit. So... Um, you said the COVID-19, um, so there's restrictions where you can only have, like, a certain amount of people that come to the services. And then do you have uh, universal precautions that you do as they come in so that you can protect them and you and the environment in which you have the services? Could you explain a little bit about that? Absolutely. We can only have 10 people in services. Um, I, have never, I haven't put, in a, put a cap on it. If... Um, if I had to, uh, but yeah, if I had to, I would have to. I mean, there's no, no way around it. But um, some people live very close to, to, to here, and they wouldn't have no problems probably going back home because we live right near here. But um, I would always leave it open for people. We have um, hand sanitizer that the usher would get at the door. You know, this is to protect the usher, this is to protect the person, you know. Right. Hand sanitizer. We also give the option for gloves. If some people right. want to wear gloves, however, we don't have masks. You know, um, we was, people will be spaced accordingly so that they will have the space that they need and um, we will worship. Um, um, we will do altar call. I won't do an altar call. I'll just do altar prayer. I will right. pray from the altar and um, um, because God, God's arms are not short. So we don't mean to be when you're at the altar at your seat and get you. Right. You know, so we just, we can touch and agree from, from over there. <laughs> Amen. And everybody's safe, and we still have service, and and God gets, still gets to be able to make sure that the church stands, because the Bible says, "Upon this rock I build my church." Yeah. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against. Come on, come on with the word. So the church is not going nowhere. So earlier you, you was talking about the song, um, the Psalms ninety one, and so uh, that's what you use to combat your fear. You want to elaborate a little bit on that? Psalms 91 is, 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 is becoming so much more than that to me. It's, it's making me realize that we need to learn how to dwell in that secret place with God. Right. Um, it, 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 it's, it's letting me know that the church has fell asleep. You know, we walk the streets and we see so much stuff going on and we don't pay it no attention. Now we've been forced to pay things attention. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we roam the streets. The saints, we walk by, you know... We walk by 10 homeless people on my block. And how many of them I know their name? Yeah. You know, so it, 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 the church, the church, we have, when I say we, because I, 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 I to myself is guilty in this, and this word is what's really helping me get to that place of repentance, you know, that to pay stuff attention, saints. When we're out there in them streets, pay attention. Because everybody out there, Everybody out there and who they say they are, you know. Right. There's, there's, there's all kind of things going on. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Right. There's all kinds of things going on out there in them streets. That's why we have to be constantly covered with the blood. COVID-19 is the least of your concerns when you're out there in them streets. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, Pastor, uh, we got some... I got a very strong question because... You know, we just wanted to get to know you and, 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 you know, now they get to experience why we love you so much. So we had someone write us and says, how do you feel about a colleague, a colleague up here, or, you know, another minister, another leader, a bishop, apostle, that displays his thorn constantly, preaching, 
Can you receive a word from them? And why? So, can I receive a word from somebody that everybody know messing up? Yeah. And why? I can receive the word from anybody. Um, I'm not going to say that God won't speak from somebody who's in their sins because uh, the scripture teaches us that there are going to be some people who say, did not prophesy in your name, did not cast out devils in your name. You know, it's, it's not, it, it ain't nothing they did anyway. It's, it's the name of Jesus that's doing it. So, you know, um, th those, those people who are caught up in their sins, for me, I can look past it. But I'm at a place in my walk with God that I know the power of the word. Um, we have to remember that everybody may or may not be on that level or have that relationship yet with God. And we should not uh, display ourselves because remember, we are examples. And that's something that I constantly remind myself of, that we are examples right. of what we want people to see that I say this is how a Christian should be acting. And as a leader, I'm going to train other people to act the way I'm acting. And if the way I'm acting is displaying something that's a problem that you're going to have to write your whole house. Because whatever bad behavior mama said, the children had. Right. Yeah. Right. If mama, if mama put too much salt in her eyes, all them children put too much salt in their eyes. They learned it from their mother. And then, so if, if you have leadership that has certain um, issues, it, it, it's going to run throughout their whole church. Their whole church going to have that same issue, same problem. If he's promiscuous, he's going to have a church full of promiscuous people. Oh, God. And that and that and that's that's how I feel about that because it, it, it's going to come from the leader. I mean, it, it's a it's a behavior that's not going to get addressed in the church, and it's a behavior that will be addressed in every church. If not, it's going to overtake a church. So we have to understand that 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 pr promiscuity has always been an issue in the church. But we're know? talking about the throwing, so we don't know if this calling had. No, no, I'm, no, I'm not saying that, I just, I just use promiscuity as a thing, I'm not saying this kind of thing, yeah, that's I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that, but I'm just using promiscuity as an example to understand that, you know, you sometimes you go to a church, you say everybody in the church is messy, you know, of course, you know, you know then you might need to take a look at the leadership, you know, this is why God got rid of half nine pennies, yeah. you know, because corrupt leadership, it, it keeps the people from being able to make contact with God. So this is this is yeah. Um, could I hear a word from him? I can hear a word from him, but um, if this is a uh, he said if this is a peer of mine, now this is a colleague, I may or may not say nothing. If this is a peer, I'm gonna address it. What's the difference between a peer and colleague? For me, a uh, colleague is just another preacher. Right. If he's a peer, he's somebody I deal with on the right. Okay. You know, it, that's how I see it. He's somebody I deal with. If it's somebody I deal with, then I think I owe it to my brother. So the Bible says, if I see my brother overtaking a fault, those which are spiritual are supposed to go to him. Right. Not go tell the rest of the people. Wait a minute, say that again. Go to him. Go to him. And not the congregation. No, to him. To steal their congregation members. No, not to steal their congregation members. No, go to him to restore such a brother. No, not to his wife either. The Bible says, I go to him to restore such a brother. Oh, so when you do go to him, you have a purpose. To restore him. We not to beat him up. Not to beat him up. Not, not to exploit him. Not to exploit him. Not to ex not expose him. Not to expose him. Not to go tell his wife. Not to cause him marital problems. The Bible says we go to such a and the Bible says quickly. So you you go to him real fast and restore such a and then restore him to restore a brother. I'm supposed to restore him. I, I ain't supposed to be talking about him trying wait to wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pastor. You went deep because I want to talk about that. So. The little issue, and I, I, I and y'all forgive me because y'all know I'm nosy. That's one of my thorns. I've, I've always told y'all that. You know, there's a few things that you know, uh, my friends and family. Y'all know how I am. Pastor Wilson, what was his leaders when he was exposed like that? Why did they quickly go and restore him? And how would they be able well, to go and restore him? I, I, I don't know if they have to restore him because sometimes rest, restoration might mean sitting down for a while. That could be part of restoration because sometimes you don't got so far off. You need to sit with yourself. You need to sit down in a therapeutic community. We call it introspective. Okay. You need to sit with yourself and begin to understand the impact your mess is having on, your, on the people that you're supposed to be directing to God. 
And we might have the ability to help him see that. His leaders. Oh, his leaders. His yeah. leaders, you know, should, should come to him. You know, bishops, you know, for me, it would be Bishop Gibson or, or uh, uh, you know, Bishop Gibson or uh, Apostle Corbin would come to me. You know, those are the people that I consider to be my leaders at the right now. Right. You know, so they, they would be the ones that bring me in the chat. And if need be, if I say they're my leaders, they would say to me, you know, all right, you know, you know, God forbid, you know, I don't think, which I think would never happen, you know, right. because I'm walking in faith. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, that they would have to say to me, you know, Eric, we need you to sit for a while. Okay, you're still the pastor, but we need you to sit for a while. And that's if you run the church for a while. And if I say I'm, and if I know and understand the impact that my thorn has had on ministry, then I would be willing to do because it's for the good. So you can rebuild yourself. So you can so you can teach this. You're also teaching your people I messed up and there's consequences for me messing up. And would you have some type of uh if you were in that place, would you have some type of lesson or something that you would add to the Bible study or how would you be able to teach the congregation that you failed? Or would you have that type of relationship with the congregation? And work on it so that you can build the trust. Well, I don't think it would be an actual teaching lesson. I think it would be more so uh, uh, a, a confessional. Uh, 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 maybe when it's all over with, tell them the reason I was sitting for a while because it doesn't matter who you are. There's consequences when you work for the Lord. There's consequences, right? You know, when when things go to that level. Okay. Because when things go to that level, that means God didn't try to send four or five people to you, and you right. this. You didn't listen. You know, he's not just gonna blow you up like that. He's gonna, he gonna send. All right, now. maybe one, of, one, maybe one member saw him. That should have been enough to scare, but that's a member that ain't gonna tell nobody. Yeah, that kept your secret. Uh -huh. So loyally. Right, right. So, so, so you keep on going, and you keep on going. You keep missing the warnings to slow down. You understand? That the guy has to expose you. You know, they, no, because and, and exposure is not because oh, oh ha ha, I look at you. I mean, you you know, fail. Yeah. No, it's not. It's not even about failure. No. Because if it was about failure, where would David be? Mm. You know, if it was about failure, failure is the whole reason um, Jacob got the birthright. <laughs> Come on, you're teaching. You're teaching. I get it now. I get it. I get it. Um, so, how would anyone be able to participate in your church? And or donate to By Faith Ministries. Well, if you want to participate in the church, you know, participation in the church requires membership. We'd like for our people to become family that work in the church. We want to make sure that you're connected with our vision, you know, to reintroduce the ministry of Jesus Christ to a forgotten nation who are afraid of what they think church is, regardless of race, color, creed, teaching them through the love of Jesus Christ how to live an abundant life through faith, because without faith it is impossible to please Him. We want people to connect with our vision. You know, if you believe that, that that this church, even if you're far away and you believe that this church is something needed for a time such as this, you know, you can always donate to our cash app, you know, uh, at uh, by faith, by faith, 2019, by faith 2019 um, cash app, mm -hmm. you can donate. Yes. So, yeah. And, uh, and um, yeah, you're always welcome. You know, we, we, um, we stream as well as have services in, 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 you know, in the house. We, you know, we're having them in the house right now, and, you know, um, now, so, you know I, I used to be a little uncomfortable with, with the having church in the house. I felt like people thought I was just playing, and I said, oh, they don't think it's serious. But um, I've been blessed over the year. We've been doing this for a year. We've, we've been out of the house into a building, and we learned so much, and sometimes you have to go back, you know, and God brought us back, and things blossomed when we came back. I, I felt like it was going to look like I was failing. And then, you know, God made me realize it wasn't about me. You know, sometimes we get caught up in that. This, this is not about me. It's not about you, Eric. It's not about you saving face. It's about saving souls. So we got to go back to a place where we can make sure that ministry works. And I'm excited about it. I just want to tell everybody, I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Elvis Corner. This is not only my leader, but this is my best friend. You know, we spend a lot of quality time together. You know, By Faith uh, Ministries not only supports uh, Elders Corner, but, you know, we're a group of family members. And I thank y'all so much for just tuning in. And remember, 
subscribe. We, we subscribe and hit the notifications and you'll be able to, every time we come on, you'll get to meet another one of our fabulous guests. If you guys want to see the Elder um, Dixon again, go ahead and leave some comments down below. Leave that question that you would like to ask him. You can cash at us at By Faith, uh, By Faith 2019. And I just want to tell you, thank you so much. And y'all have a blessed and glorious night.